Hello, everybody. I'm Dustin Lefebvre, marketing lead at Decred. I'm here with... Jake Yocumpiat, project lead for Decred until I decentralize my job away. Yeah, well, it's not that far away. Um, thanks for joining us. We're here on a deep dive, and we are going to talk about a really, really interesting topic that everyone is curious about. We've had all kinds of conversation. Thank you, everyone on Twitter for submitting questions. Um, we're going to talk about the Lightning Network. And in order to do that, we've got Mateus De Giovanni, who is a Brazilian developer for Decred with us today. Mateus, could you join us, please? Hello. Hello. Nice. Hi there, Mateus. You for having me. Beep, beep, beep. Thank you so much for joining us. So just to give you a brief outline of what we're going to talk about, we're going to go through basics, definitions, what is Lightning Network, why does it matter. Um, kind of, you'll bring us up to speed on where we are with respect to Lightning on the Decred project. And then I'm going to share all kinds of questions and um, just, yeah, in, in, interesting questions that people had from the project. Um, inquiring minds will want to know. So hopefully uh, we'll, we'll, we'll span a lot of uh, space in this conversation. So Mateus, just give us a brief introduction of yourself and how you came into Decred. Okay, so uh, I'm uh, I'm 35 years old, and I've been a coder for about uh, uh, well ever since I started using computers. Uh, so I've come to Decred uh, in a very pragmatic way because in about mid 2017 I had just left my previous job, and I was taking a few months to figure out what I was going to do next after my last job. And I noticed the blog post on, uh, that Jake posted on Decred's blog about uh, recruiting people, recruiting developers. And I just figured, well, this, seem, this seems like a, a different thing. I need to get some open source cred up because I, I didn't really have uh, much of a, a portfolio online so I wanted to do some uh, free software projects uh, to get some stuff on github and I just picked a weekend and sent like three or four PRs during a, a, a long weekend and then we started talking about uh, me becoming a part-time contractor yeah was, was there a specific dev that you reached out to or worked with uh, directly uh, uh, not at first, not uh, directly or specifically. Though, since I started uh, contributing mainly to the Crediton, uh, in the mostly in the JavaScript uh, bits, I mostly interacted with the lead dev at the time, which was Jake's brother, or is still is Jake's brother, <laughs> Alex. Uh, Jake hasn't some... been able to fix that yet. <laughs> And the other devs that were doing a, a big revamp of the Crediton at the time. Yeah. And so, how did you make your way into the Lightning Network? Uh, uh, since I met Jake, I first met Jake when he came to Brazil in 2018, I think early 2018. Uh, and at the time, I was starting the work on the split ticket the on-chain split ticket solution. Mm -hmm. And he kind of hinted to me that we wouldn't want to keep the on-chain split ticket for a very long time because it's really inefficient. Uh, and he hinted to me that Lightning would be the, maybe not ultimate solution, but would probably be the direction we'd want to take. Uh, to ensure a greater participation in the, the staking process. Mm -hmm. And so ever since that, I started uh, studying a little bit of Lightning and trying to figure out how to, how to bring split tickets into Lightning. And eventually, since before bringing split tickets to Lightning, Lightning we needed to get Lightning on the cred because <laughs> uh, otherwise we can have uh, split tickets on Lightning, so I really started to, to just uh, take one step at a time what I needed to do to bring Lightning. So, for example, uh, in late 2018, I worked on the, the fee estimation uh, package for DCRD, which is one or was one of the requirements to get Lightning on Decred. 
So I just right. started working step by step to get to where we are. Awesome. Thanks for that explanation. Go well, ahead. and so something that I that, that I figure is worth sort of following up about is that so so you took over uh, in terms of LN. The initial work was done by Dave Collins, right? So Dave C got the ball yes. rolling. And what I what I remember very specifically about it was Dave Dave was of the mind. He's like, I've gotten it really far, but I don't really feel like doing this last bit. And you know, then Mateus appeared and 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 ran the ball into the end zone. So I figure that's worth uh, calling out because it was you know it was a it was a project that was it was sort of languishing, and then you know it just took it took some uh, TLC from someone like Mateus to you know really make it happen. Nice. Let's circle back and let's just put some building blocks in place. Can you explain to us in the audience very basically what the Lightning is and kind of how it works? So Lightning Network is what is called a second layer solution for payments. Uh, it's, it's a payment network that is built on top of the base layer, which is, the, which is a cryptocurrency like Decred or Bitcoin. So Lightning uses smart contracts, uses uh, specific constructions in the base layer to allow you to create a settlement layer that doesn't require or mostly doesn't require on-chain confirmations for your payment to succeed. So the, the very uh, small or the very brief gist of Lightning is that it allows you to build uh, a payment network on top of a settlement layer, which is the base layer of a cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Can you dive in a little bit into that extra layer? What does it look like, right? Channels and nodes and that kind of thing. So it, it, Lightning is, is a very different beast than, than the base layer. And uh, just uh, to link up to what Jake said, uh, it's a lot of work and it's very dissimilar, it's very different than the base layer. So on, on Lightning, a channel is basically the, the way you interact with the payment network. So in order to send a payment through, through the network to some receiver, you need to have a channel into the network. And this network is going to hop, it's, it's going to route your payment across several channels as if it, it was a, a, an IP network switching packets. So it's going to switch your payment from your node through your channels and through several intermediate channels until it reaches the destination. So that's the, that's the general uh, high level overview of what the, the network looks like. So it, it's a graph. Uh, several links of uh, nodes, each node connected to another with a channel. And a channel is basically a special uh, transaction in the base layer. So to open a channel into the network means that you need to contact a node. You need to agree on the terms of this channel, how, how large it's going to be, uh, how long it will take to settle it, and so on. Uh, and then you you both cooperate to sign to create and sign and publish a special transaction in the network in the base layer. And once this transaction is confirmed, after a, a number of blocks, this transaction is confirmed. Then you have an open channel into the network, and you can send and receive payments through this channel. So something that, that I like to say when it comes to uh, you know uh, the Lightning Network is that it's a routed communications network, right? So just like Mateus was describing, there's all of these channels, they all connect. Whereas on the blockchain, you know, Mateus and I can be on opposite sides of the planet, and he sends me a transaction, and it comes, it ends up, and it ends up getting directly to me. It's a broadcast network. Whereas Lightning Network is a routed, uh, you know, uh, communication system. So in order for us to find a path from Mateus to me, there might be just as he was saying, a dozen nodes in between, mm -hmm. and each of those then has these channels that he speaks sure. of. And if I wanted to send money via Lightning to Mateus, I would have to open up a channel with him, and then I would fund that channel. Is that right, uh, Mateus? N no, not no. necessarily. Uh, if you want to send money to me, if you want to send a payment to me directly, 
then yes, we need an, an open channel. But as long as I have an open channel to the network and you have an open t- channel to the network and there is a route that this panel, this payment can flow from you to me, then we don't need a direct channel between us. We can use intermediaries to to make the, the payment reach my, my channels. Mm-hmm. But do you basically need to fund the Lightning Network or your fund your access to the Lightning Network in some way? How does it know that you have the funds? Yeah, yes, you, you need to, uh, the process of opening a channel is exactly what you described. It is informing to the Lightning Network that you have some funds uh, along with uh, uh, your counterparty, the other, the other node on the other side of the channel, that you can both send and receive payments up to the capacity of this channel. You, pro- you prove that you have funds by sending the transaction on chain. Okay. Um, so there are a bunch of other, a couple of other layer two scaling solutions. Um, can you guys just briefly explain why Lightning was selected as opposed to alternatives? So the the major the major alternatives to to scaling uh, base layer or the alternatives for a payment network would be to use a side chain yeah. or to use a different cryptocurrency or to use a, a, a centralized uh, a centralized oracle. Uh, which are obvious solutions that we don't don't want. Maybe side chains would be an alternative, but uh, I'm not sure they are that well received in the community. Well, are they really uh, 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 scaling solutions on the order that we're interested in? I'm sorry. Can, uh, can are, you... are are they are they are they truly scaling solutions? Right. You're referring to side chains, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Because they're also blockchains. Well, no, a side chain, well, it, it depends on what you mean by blockchain. I mean, okay. one way to view it is, is that every cryptocurrency is a side chain of another one. But, uh, it, but you know, side chains typically are explicit. So you're a side chain of cryptocurrency mm-hmm. X as opposed to you're just a standalone chain. I mean, I don't know. I mean, my, my perception of the side chain solution is, is that you're going to run into the same problem, which is you run into the Oracle problem, right? All of the routing nodes have to end up being in data centers and then you're beholden to whoever controls the data center, which, you know, is typically a very small number of people. Yeah. All right, so you, the code as I understand it, comes from two different places, basically. You have Lightning Labs code and you have Bitcoin that has done a bunch of development on on Lightning. Can you explain kind of what you have done and how you interact with, with, with those entities and their code? Uh, so there are actually, I think, three major Lightning implementations. So there's the the one from Lightning Net Labs, which is LND. There is C Lightning, which is from Blockstream, and there is Eclair, which is uh, I'm not super familiar with the the backing entity, but it's uh, uh, an independent uh, implementation. Uh, our solution for Lightning is entirely based on LND because LND is entirely based on BTCD, which was developed by Company Zero back in the day <laughs> before Decred. Uh, so that was the natural solution for our version of Lightning to be based on uh, something that is also that also gave rise to the core protocols for Decred, or for the core code for Decred. So can you explain the process of, of porting over that LND code to Decred? Yeah, so as Jake hinted, uh, Dave started working on this, I think, in early 2017, sometime in 2017, I think. Uh, and I started to really dig down into it in about uh, at about January 2018. Basically, the the main challenge to port the LND work into Decred's code base or Decred's chain is that 
the layout for transactions is pretty much entri entirely different in Decred than on SegWit-based Bitcoin. So there are a lot of uh, a lot of the the way the transactions are signed and the way the transactions are structured, the scripts are structured, the way addresses are handled. That's all different in Decred than what happens on Bitcoin based on SegWit. So the main work had to be to to tweak these kinds of things. So that's uh, the 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 most uh, the thing that needed the most careful attention was on preparing the scripts or fixing the scripts so that they worked on Decred as with the same semantics as they work on Bitcoin. There are small stuff that there's very small stuff that sometimes trips us. So, for example, Decred fixed uh, the the opmut sig extra pop in the strict in the script language. So that's like it's easy to say that oh, we fixed a small bug in the script language that was based on Bitcoin. We fixed on Decred. But to actually get in the code and fix all instances where that is relevant and figure out all instances that might be affected by changing that is work that you really have to be very careful in doing. Because otherwise you might break a transaction and, and later on you might find that you can't redeem your coins. And that would be <laughs> really bad. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I guess my sense of it is is that so so what you're describing here is 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 roughly very delicate surgery. It's very it's it's not surface level changes like oh I make a couple twiddles here and there. It's oh wow we have to adjust the transaction format just so so that it works with Decred in a subtle way that requires a deep understanding of the scripts involved. And so I mean I don't know about I don't know how many of our viewers are aware of this, but smart smart contracts are not uh, exactly easy to write, particularly when you're dealing with TX script. So uh, you know people like Mateus and their expertise here are are invaluable because uh, I would say out of our whole dev team there might be two or three people who could do this work and that's about it and Mateus is one of them. So Mateus <clears throat> and, and Jake, I'll ask this to both of you. In, in 2017, pretty much every cryptocurrency had Lightning Network on their roadmap. Everyone had plans to implement this stuff. And as you previously mentioned, Mateus, there are three, right? It's Decred, Bitcoin, and Litecoin. Um, why is that? Uh, so that goes back to the first point in that uh, Lightning is a beast of a protocol to work with. It's really... Uh, large and it's can, still very can you much give us some scale evolving. On that? Can, can you give us a little bit of scale when you say it's large? What, what does that mean? Uh, well, uh, here, okay, so here's something to cue Mateus. Maybe you could talk about the, uh, what was it, the sync commit or the, was it the sync PR you made for, for a sense of scale? Right. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, the sync PR, the, the first one that uh, I, wo I worked that synced our version of Lightning to the upstream work of LND that happened between January 2018 and about June 2018, sorry, January 2019 to June 2019. That was about a thousand commits, but something like 30,000 lines of code, 40,000 lines of code or something uh, that I had to check uh, one by one. Oh. To just to bring and just to bring the updates that happened while we were writing our, our port of the lightning. So so uh, I, I happen to know the numbers off the top of my head. It's way more than what Mateus is describing. The 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 PR in question was a plus one hundred thousand lines minus twenty thousand yeah. lines. Uh, you know, uh, sync commit, and I mean. For, for anyone to have the patience and sort of, you know, grit to go through it, I mean, it, I salute you, Mateus. <laughs> yeah, it's not super fun work to do. Uh, I have another 300 to check from between <laughs> when uh, point 0.2 hour, point 0.2 version was released to about now. 
Uh, so uh, the upstream LND guys are planning to release a new version probably about early January. So I have about 300 extra commits to, <laughs> to check. So th this is going to be a very, very much an ongoing work to be able to keep up with the upstream work that that is happening in LND. There are a lot of things. So as I said, the protocol for LND is still very much evolving, very much in flux. Uh, so this is going to be still a, a very long journey until uh, Lightning is really, really stable. So Lightning was on testnet for, for quite a long time. Can you just well, well, go well, ahead? Hey, there's actually something. So, so I noticed, uh, what was it we had asked about? So what is it that, so you answer, you just answered yeah. the question of what made it so hard to get the, this all working on Decred? But right, so everyone else had this on their on their uh, milestone list to be like, oh, we're gonna add Lightning Network, and Li Litecoin did it real quick, uh, and everyone else just sort of punted and or either didn't do it. I mean, could you could you tell us a little bit about your perception of those two things? Right. So so L and D is was written to support both Bitcoin and Litecoin. So th uh, out of the gate, they supported both. Because the the transaction structure is essentially identical, at least from I, I'm not really super familiar with Litecoin on a technical level, but at least from glancing on the LND code base, uh, it's basically a switch to 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 change the for example the Genesis hash from one chain to the other and to change the relatives. Uh, the relative fee rates from one chain to the other. So Bitcoin and Litecoin are essentially, for all, for all intents and purposes, they are identical uh, for, from the point of view of Lightning. Uh, anything that deviates even a little bit from that is going to have a really tough time rewriting uh, all the code base to, to be able to work with Lightning. So, so, so your perception is is that so in the case of Litecoin, it was just an extremely easy port, and then in the in the context of these other uh, of these other cryptocurrencies, th that it's the the level of detail, uh, and, you know, and sort of uh, you know challenge of doing the work was enough for them to go like, yeah, we're not going to bother. Uh, yeah. So I I can't really say what the other chains are thinking. Uh, I can't really say they they're unanimously saying oh we are not going to bother but for <laughs> litcoin <laughs> for litcoin uh, it wasn't so much that it was an easy port it it's basically just a flag that you have to set somewhere it's just a a couple of parameters that you need to to change so it's really it's really easy for Litecoin to, to support, to be supported in Lightning. Uh, any, any blockchain that changed any aspect of how scripts are ran, uh, any other project that, that changed how transactions are laid out, they, they're going to have a much tougher time uh, in, in adapting the, the Lightning code bases as they exist today. The, the code bases for, for Lightning, LND was ostensibly designed from the ground up to be a multi-coin or a multi-chain Lightning implementation, but they're really, really not <laughs> at this time. They're really The Lightning implementations really are not uh, multi-coin for anything other than Bitcoin and Litecoin, which are identical. So, so any coin attempting to implement Lightning really are going to have to, to design or, or code or adapt the whole thing. So, um, you know, so, so what you're telling me is that the Litecoin dev team must have been very large and worked for a very long time to port Lightning to, uh, to, to, to Litecoin, right? Yeah, well, I, I don't have any insights. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, uh, probably the... Uh, uh, I'm not familiar with the history of the whole history of development for, for L&D, 
but it seems to me that it really was uh, it probably even very early it it started keep, uh, bringing in litecoin support yeah All right let's let's uh move forward and focus a little bit about lightning network um you know with decred um it's been on testnet for the majority of a year right probably more than half a year um just give us a brief overview of of what that looks like and what the testing process looks like so it's going to remain on testnet it's not leaving testnet testnet is going to to keep running so we can uh, debug stuff early uh, and while we're we're moving into mainnet now on the one one five zero or one point five uh, release cycle, uh, it's still very much early days for Decred's Lightning. So even though we've been running on testnet and basically uh, we've been opening channels and, and trying to to test possible applications for Lightning on testnet. Uh, we've been trying to ensure that all breach scenarios are covered. So uh, we have uh, LND had the, uh, a very, uh, very uh, extensive suite of tests that we've adapted, and I've tr been trying to improve on that a little bit. That to ensure that all possible breach situations are covered. And hopefully now on mainnet, uh, our main goal in releasing into mainnet right now is to get more people to try it out and 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 give us some feedback on what we can do to improve both the user experience for Lightning and, and the the integrations that we are going to be releasing shortly. So so in terms of uh... You know the structure of this network. Could you could you say a little bit about that? Like you, you know, you talked about these channels, but what about uh, you know what about people who aren't sort of the end users of channels? Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what like the, the intermediate what? the intermediate nodes, right? Because there's people who are sort of consumers mm -hmm. of Lightning. Like let's say Dustin and I, or Dustin, and you want to send payments back and forth. There's going to be people in between who route these payments, so so that I figure that that might be worth worth talking about a little bit. Yeah. So the the intermediate nodes, the the hubs or the the intermediate hops for Lightning are really essential in that they they are necessary for you to get a a, a good. Um, I'm not sure spread of the network or, or a good uh, connectivity between endpoints in the network. So the same way that you we need a, a, a large number of full nodes running on the base layer to get transactions from one end of the network to another, from one end of the physical network to another uh, quickly enough, uh, we also need a very large or, or, or as large as possible number of Hub uh, or node operators online in order to in order to get payments from one side of the Lightning network to another. So the the node operators are people that are going to leave their node running 24/7 basically, and that are going to receive uh, an incentive to route payments in the form of a payment fee. So every time. Uh, any two users, for example, you and Dustin want to exchange a payment if Dustin wants to pay to you, all the intermediate nodes are going to receive a small fee for routing this payment. So uh, if we have a large number of nodes online, that is going to be beneficial for the network because if one node goes offline, then there are multiple routes to get the payment out between the edges. So, so I think another takeaway from this is is that there's really sort of two classes of users we're looking for here. There's there's people who would operate intermediate nodes, and uh, you know those typically would be people who are a little bit more sysadmin oriented and you know understand the risks and can manage having a daemon that runs 24/7 and and has hot funds. 
versus uh, you know a, you know sort of an you know an end user of one of these networks like either a merchant or you know somebody who's a, you know who's a customer at a you know at a business or of a service who then only opens a channel either to mainly to receive or to spend or some combination thereof versus <coughs> route intermediate payments on behalf of the rest of the network participants. So I just figure it's it's useful yeah. to sort of explain that there are these two groups of people we're looking for. Yeah. So the sysadmin people, I think that within the project, there's a fair number of us, like, you know, Mateus will obviously be one of these people. I'll be one of these people. And, you know, yeah. there's a number of more technical people. But, you know, from the end user perspective, we also need that kind of testing. Yeah. So so if I wanted to run a, a node, how would I go about doing that? So if you want to uh, run a, a hub node and uh, a node that is going to be able to route payments through the network. You basically need a server somewhere. Uh, and if you are already familiar with running a Decred software, it's, the process is going to be pretty much the same. You're going to, to run a daemon that's going to run. You're, you need to open up a port to receive connections to this daemon. Uh, and then you're, you're going to need to monitor, obviously, you're going to need to monitor the, this software, this bit of software. Uh, it's going to have some uh, sysadmin uh, work, some administration work that you're going to need to perform from time to time. Mm -hmm. But it's basically uh, a server that's, that is going to be ran in the background of your server. Uh, you, as, as Jake hinted, you also need some funds in this wallet. You're going to need to transfer some funds into the wallet that is running uh, your Lightning node so that it can open up channels to other nodes in the network. Yeah. Kozel had a very specific question around nodes. He said, in order to increase the robustness of, of DCRLN, um, do we want more nodes with the same seed, as in the case of, of solo voting wallets, more nodes with different seeds, or fewer nodes with greater capacity, or some combination of, of, of those three options? So you don't want nodes with the same seed running at the same time in Lightning. So in this aspect, it's different than VSPs. Uh, Lightning is based on, on contacting specific nodes to to perform the payments so for example if i have a, a an open channel to you and i need to send a, a payment through your node then i need to contact your node at a given ip address specifically so it doesn't really make sense to run the same seed that is the same node with the same keys and the same funds in different locations it's better to have at different nodes at different locations using different funds completely uh, different servers and so on so it's better to have as much of a separate infrastructure as possible uh, and in terms of capacity uh, as much capacity as we can bring in uh, the more the better yeah so so many people are focused on, on actually using LN and so a number of people asked what is the current UX? Um, so can you talk about how one would go about using that? Is, is there something in Decrediton yet? And... Yeah, so on 1.5, on the 1.5 release cycle, we are shipping Decred, uh, Lightning support in Decrediton. So we can now uh, use Decred, uh, use Lightning directly from Decrediton. However, uh, on the first release, we are sending it uh, disabled via a specific config option. So if you want to test out Lightning, you need to go to, a conf to the, the credit on config file and enable it. And we are doing this specifically because right now we want to favor people that are, are really understanding and really uh, can really help in giving feedback that is accurate enough for us to iterate in Lightning. So if, if, if we leave this enabled uh, by default, someone is going to click the button and something is going to happen and they are not going to be able to explain exactly what happened. So right now we are shipping uh, support uh, disabled by default 
and you're going to users that want to try out lightning are going to have to enable it uh, and then come look Lucas in the chats for for more information and to give some feedback on what the usage is uh, we're going to to try a, and generate and send payments and just try try to get people to actually test out the software in, uh, people that are still uh, advanced users but not necessarily developers or not necessarily people that are are every day using the cred sure. already yeah are, are we still recommending that you only put as much money in there as you're you're willing to lose <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think that applies to yeah, cryptocurrencies so, in general right yeah and that's the general advice for any uh, any new software <laughs> so in the credit on it's going to by default it's going to create an ln specific account if you don't mm -hmm. do anything if you don't change any settings by default it's going to create a new account when you first try to create your lightning wallet and by default that account is going to be is going to have a zero balance sure. so you are going to need to transfer some funds from your regular account your default account into your lightning account mm -hmm. so you probably want to start out small uh, send 0.1 decred uh, 1 decred so send a small amount of, of funds we still have some caps some reasonably low caps on lightning so for example the largest channel that you can open right now is still limited to 10 dcr okay. so you're not going to be able to open very large channels into the network just yet because we really want to want to iterate on making sure that everyone is safe sure and and, and am i right to uh recall that that what's been tested so far is roughly that um you know you can enable this you can create channels you can close channels and then you can both send and receive into these channels yes exactly we we've also tested well i personally tested uh, the the breach scenario so things like uh, uh, if I force close the channel will I get my DCR back uh, if someone attempts to close the channel with an, uh, an early, earlier state of the channel uh, I can send the justice transactions to get back the full funds for the channel so the, the breach scenario scenarios which are called uh, in lightning uh, i've also tested those i've also tested but that's not yet uh i don't have a new UI ready for that yet on the credit on but i've tested for example the backup the static backup solution that is going in that is enabled in point eight uh, i've tested the watch towers I've tested the autopilot features, so I've personally tested pretty much all the features in the LND, uh, but we don't necessarily have a, a pretty UI for every one of them yet. Sure. So this isn't something that normies can just jump into and uh, <laughs> lose all their money with. It's probably a good thing. Yeah. Um, a, lot, a lot of people ask questions of comparatively speaking between BTC and DCR kind of happens naturally um, so let's let's start off with with an infrastructure question can you compare uh, DCR LN to BTC LN in, in its architecture so the the architecture is pretty much the same uh, while I haven't really made any significant architectural changes uh, except for the part uh, where the the DCR and MD, the daemon interacts with the DCRD daemon, the the full node daemon, and the wallet uh, daemons. So there aren't really uh, architectural changes in the Lightning specific side of things. Uh, there are more changes in the coin specific. Uh, side of things. Uh, one change, one significant change that uh, I've made is that w you can connect your Lightning node, your Lightning daemon, to a wallet node or to a wallet uh, daemon. 
And so you won't need to use a separate seed for the lightning node. So instead of, of having to, to store and manage a specific seed for your main wallet and a seed for your lightning node, you can use the same wallet as both uh, an on-chain regular wallet in the CR wallet or the credit on, and as, a, as the source of funds for a lightning node. So that's a, a significant change in our architecture and is the basis for the integration of lightning to the credit on. So that, that's mainly the, the, the thing that allows you to run uh, the credit on wallet and not have to take care of a, a separate seed to set up your lightning node. And I guess something else that's worth mentioning here is is that beyond the complexity of the of the seeds that Mateus is is referencing, um, so LND, the one that runs on Bitcoin, um, has a built-in LN wallet, which is sort of a little mini built-in wallet. And rather than have that running, which takes up extra memory and you know and CPU, uh, what we have then is we have a single wallet that the DCR LN you know LN daemon. Uh, talks to and then and then that keeps memory usage and cpu usage down compared to a similar uh, you know configuration say for for bitcoin where you might need a bitcoin uh, you know a bitcoin daemon of some kind and the light and the ln daemon yeah so the next question right on... so so uh, ju just uh, just uh, that's sort of uh that's sort of obvious to me. So thank you for clarifying that <laughs> yeah. because, uh, to me. That's sort of a. Uh, well, I mean, I know you spent a lot of time working on it, and it was it, it, <laughs> yeah. it was effectively necessary to have a proper user experience. So it's like, oh, okay, Katie, it did UX right. You pretty much had to do that. But I figured, you know, it's an extra it's an extra point worth calling out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, but just uh, uh, another thing that is important is that uh, once you have this uh, this connection is that uh, not all of your wallet funds are uh, are at stake from your DCRL and D node, from your Lightning node. So the Lightning node only, co only really connects to a single account from your main wallet. And so it's not going to, to pick up every single fund or every, every single DCR from your original wallet. It's only going to derive uh, its keys and, and take care of the funds from a single account so that you can remain using your wallet, your regular wallet uh, for on-chain uh, on operations or for staking. And LN is not going to interfere with that. That sounds like a good security measure. Um, Luke Powell on Twitter had uh, a, a great question about whether DCR's ability to make hard fork consensus changes uh, gives it any sort of advantages over BTC in the in the layer two arena it's kind of a theoretical question yeah so uh, that that's really the same uh, the same uh, the same view for any other own chain changes that we might want to make so the the greatest benefit of having the ability to to easily hard fork, or maybe easily is not, not the right word, but to uh, safely or to, to, to reach a soft consensus on upgrading the hard consensus rules in a deterministic way and in a final way, uh, that gives us, uh, I, I think the greatest thing is that gives us agility in making hard forking changes or in making consensus changes. So, for example, there's been a lot of talk about uh, Taproot and moving to Schnorr 6 uh, and adding new new opcodes or adding new SIG hash types, signature hash types that would improve Lightning. And so, given that we can reach uh, an agreement for making consensus rules, consensus rule changes uh, in a more easier or a more controlled fashion, I think that gives us more agility to to also adapt to changes in, in upstream lightning. Sure. Sounds like it's not unique to, to this area, but it applies to anything related to decred and that it 
it will, you know, it formalizes changes, formalizes agreement, and you know, prevents us from from having hard fork breakoffs and and you know, losing community over things. Right, and and, and this is just uh, another thing that other coins are going to have to to keep track of if they want to <laughs> enter the same Lightning network that Bitcoin is creating. So if, for example, uh, in a few months or a few years, we have moved to L2, which is a proposed uh, upgrade to Lightning that adds uh, a different type of signature hash calculation. Uh, every other coin that wants to keep up with the Bitcoin Lightning is going to have to introduce something similar to this change. So our ability to, to, to have a formal way of doing the hard fork uh, makes us really suitable to, even if we can't, uh, hopefully we can move faster than Bitcoin, but we certainly can at least keep up, which is already a, 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 big, uh, a big advantage. I mean, something something that occurs to me that's that's kind of unique here, right, is if we talk about, say, technological stacks, something that ends up happening in a lot of cases, right, is, is that, you know, like there's, uh, with routed telecommunications, layer one, the physical layer was developed and, you know, people turned that into integrated circuits. And then, you know, there's layer two and then there's the link layer and then there's, you know, layer three and then you start to add IP. And something about that process is, is that when that process has happened historically, you can't change the underlying layers, right? It's like once you have layer two, it's like frozen. If you're going to make changes to layer two, it's got to be like the plane is going to crash into the mountain if we don't make these changes. Otherwise, nobody's changing anything. So what I like about, you know, what we're doing here with Decred is, is that... If something at layer two, uh, you know, becomes clear to us like, oh, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could make this layer one change to improve things at layer two? We have a system, not only do we have a system for doing that, we have a system for doing that that sort of aligns us with the interests of the people in the games so that it's not just like, well, if the, as long as the plane doesn't crash into the mountain, we're not going to make any changes. You know, we can go, oh, no, here's a way to incrementally improve it and keep that process going. So I think that that's a, it's kind of unique to have this in the context of a technological stack because right. to date with the OSI model, you just can't you mo for the most part you can't do that yeah kind of makes me think of uh, all those smart contracts from Molech DAO that were rendered <laughs> ineffective when Ethereum oh. made some changes Ooh. yeah own the stack uh, <laughs> awkward <laughs> <laughs> uh, well let's 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 move on a little bit and talk about using using LN um, is it someone asked is it peer-to-peer -peer only or can it be integrated into payment processors and Noah asked specifically if we have a strategy of, of working with existent, existing merchants who are accepting Decred to ensure that they can accept it over LN as well. So it's the greatest, uh, the greatest the attraction of, of Lightning is that it's permission, it's mostly permissionless. So it's not entirely permissionless like the base layer. Uh, because you need to find someone who is willing to open up a channel to you, so it's not entirely permissionless or as permissionless as the base layer, but it's still pretty much uh, pretty permissionless. So as long as you can find one person willing to open up a channel, you can participate in the, the larger network. So one of the attractions of Lightning is that it's a payment network that is peer-to-peer, uh, but it's not necessarily uh, going to be used as in, uh, by everyone as a peer-to-peer -peer network, the same way that people, for example, use uh, certain wallets that are not entirely decentralized or not entirely peer-to-peer -peer, that, for example, use uh, a centralized servers. So you can also have Lightning wallets that are, for example, custodial Lightning wallets. So uh, uh, I know there's some talk about uh, people offering that. Custodial Lightning wallets, the same way that you have a custodial uh, cryptocurrency wallets. Exit uh, I don't really see the appeal for that. Uh, the, that seems to kind of miss the point of, of uh, having control of your own funds. But uh, that's something that does have an attraction for for people not so used to uh, to to entire permissionless uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, uh, in regards to merchants, 
Uh, I'm not sure we have a, a, a stra an ongoing strat strategy right now, since we're still just starting out on, on Lightning. I think our strategy before attempting to, to engage with merchants is going to be to figure out stuff that we can uh, dog food the Lightning. Uh, dog food lightning into our own ecosystem. So we're going to try and find places where we can replace on-chain fees for lightning fees, for example. So, so I have a question because I think that's the first time I, I've re I've always referred to the process as eating your own dog food, but you used it as a verb, dog fooding. Is that is that a, is that a yeah, commonly I'm accepted sorry. No, usage? That's just a, that's probably just a translation quirk. Yo, I, <laughs> hey, I mean translation. You know, you know uh, what is it? Uh, translations aside, I think it's hilarious to to reduce you know the act of eating your own dog food to dog fooding. I, I really I, I quite like that. <laughs> Nice. Well, thank you. Let's let's talk about. Um, we had a number of questions about privacy. Um, when 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 things cross intermediate nodes, the quantity is known to these nodes. So, give us kind of both sides of, of privacy and and how privacy on LN compares to on chain. Right. So right now, privacy. I'd say privacy is worse in LN than on in the base layer. Uh, because not only is the amount crossing or the rough amount of the payment at least, intermediate nodes, uh, they may not know the, the final amount because the, the payments are structured in an onion payment structure. So every node, uh, every payment packet is a, a little onion encoded packet. So every node just picks up the outer layer, figures out who the next node is and passes the payment along. So the payment is not entirely uh, known or, or the final destination of the payment is not necessarily known. Uh, the amount is currently known or knowable. Uh, and also all the currently all the intermediate nodes assign the same payment hash to the same payment, that is to say, uh, if you have a, a large enough view of the network, if you have a large enough percentage of the hubs, if you control a large enough percentage of the hubs in the network, you can have a pretty good view of who is paying whom and for how much, right? There are some, there is some work being done to to improve on that in Lightning. So, for example, one thing that is being worked on in the, the upstream Lightning, in the Bitcoin Lightning network, is the ability to, to do multi-path payments. So instead of, go, instead of going through a single route to send your payment, you can use multiple routes to send your payment. And these different routes are uncorrelated so you can't really tell that, oh, if I have to do a, a 10 DCR payment and one is one payment is going through this route and one DCR payment is going through this route, uh, you don't really have as much knowledge about the, the, the payments and therefore you have much more privacy in the payments. Uh, so that, that is still really an, an ongoing work that is going to take some time to to get on, on lightning i mean my understanding of it too is that the way things are running currently is that uh you know academics are publishing papers and you know they have been and continue to publish papers on this topic because this is a lot like a normal sort of you know routed electromagnetic telecommunications right so if we're communicating over tor there's all these hops in the middle and if you have a view of enough of the network because it's low latency the nsa can figure out who's sending what to who and it's even it's actually even more challenging in the context of uh these payment networks because each node needs to know what the balance of each of their channel channels is so they have to see the amounts that are coming in and out so so it's it, it's almost worse than tor because at least with tor you can do the onion you can do the onion and the whole payload is encrypted and then they peel off a layer whereas in this case the route is in, is to some to some extent encrypted but the amount you know you can't be because the people everyone needs to know how much to shift their channels by mm -hmm. so it's a it's 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 a it's a it's a serious challenge and it's very different than on-chain privacy in that regard very interesting 
Um, a lot of people have made mention about the interoperability of BTC, LTC, and DCR LN. Um, can you tell us how that works? Yeah, so that's one of the last things we've we've brought in before uh, before uh, preparing 1.5, which is the ability to use the same payment hash uh, in Decred's LN version and Bitcoin and Litecoin's LN version. So basically, uh, the payment hash. So so basically, how payments work is that the receiver for a payment generates a random number, a 32-bit, 32-byte random number, hashes this number, and then this hash is the payment hash which binds every payment route or which binds every payment attempt to the given uh, payment invoice or to the given payment amount. Uh, in order to have interoperability, interoperability between the chains, you need to use the same hashing algorithm in all chains. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, we've had in Decred, I think we've had a, a vote to enable uh, SHA-256. Uh, exactly one of the purposes for was exactly to be able to create a lightning network which spans multiple coins. So with this change brought in, we can create a payment in uh, Decred's Lightning Network with a given payment hash. We can pick up this payment hash, uh, create, uh, start the payment in a different network, in Bitcoin, for example. And once the Lightning Networks are fully merged, once we have a... a, a, a a system or a, a mechanism to to change the payment from one network to the other or to route the payment from one network to the other, then we can perform a payment that crosses both chains instantly and atomically and seamlessly. This this. This mechanism doesn't exist yet. It's on. It's a work in progress. It's being worked on, but it's something that it's really going to be interesting to see. I mean, my my sense of it is is that am I am I right to recall that you've done some testing to verify that this works? But I mean, the, the missing ingredient is right. It, it would be something like an exchange daemon that does the LN exchange process, right? Yeah, so there, uh, I have tested this. Uh, it works in a crude way. So you can pick up uh, an invoice from Decred, Decred's Lightning, create uh, an invoice which is compatible to Bitcoin's Lightning, and you, then you can use a special software, a special demo or a special uh, exchange-like uh, demo software, which is going to swap the, the payment from one network to the other. So it's working effectively as a, uh, as a middle node in the payment. Uh, th this works, this is reasonably easy to do. Uh, hopefully we'll have a, a more polished version <laughs> soon enough. Uh, but the, the, real, the real goal, the real end game for multi-coin Lightning is when this can be done automatically via the the routing package or the routing subsystem that the Lightning daemon uses to make decisions on what are going to be the routes for a given payment. So the, the tests that, that I've done are all manual. So you have to go to the, the this website, type in the invoice, you're going to get back another invoice in your other chain, you're going to go back to your wallet and pay this invoice. So this is all manual stuff. The real end game is to have an automated stuff that can figure out, oh, look, uh, paying this, this Bitcoin invoice by going through a Decred node is cheaper than going through this whole Bitcoin uh, path, <laughs> for example. So that would be the, the real end goal of integration and you obvi obviously you need some some source for uh, for 
uh, exchange rate Cleaning info. House, yeah. yeah, yeah, you uh, need to pull you, in you the exchange need, rate from somewhere, right? Yes, you need to get the exchange rate from from somewhere. So this is where the this is one of the points where the DEX is going to come in. It's going to supply the information for the exchange rate in a decentralized way without having to 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 rely on an oracle that might want to cheat on your exchange rate. So Decred Dragon asked on Twitter um, how liquidity might be provided, and he also asked if, if it would involve the DEX. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's going to be uh, uh, the, the liquidity for Decred's Lightning is going to be provided much in the same way for Bitcoin, though hopefully we can combine a couple of different uh, different roles for these online nodes mm -hmm. that we're seeing. So, for example, we have the VSP, we have uh, uh, Lightning nodes or Lightning hubs, uh, we have DEX servers or DEX nodes that are going to want to participate. So, what we're seeing is that uh, we are trying to set up a bunch of services that people might want to use their their decred that isn't necessarily staked they might want to be using these servers their these services to to provide liquidity to the network in exchange for uh, some fees or some incentives awesome thank you for that that's fascinating uh, let's move on to a recent blog that you put out. It was about ticket splitting on layer two. We talked about it briefly earlier. Um, I think a lot of people have kind of misunderstood it or, or jumped to conclusions about it. Um, can can you just explain, you know, where you are in that process and, and why you put the blog out in the first place? <laughs> yeah, so, so the blog post was just me coming full circle <laughs> to what I wanted to do in the first place. When I started working on on Lightning, which was to get to figure out basically to be able to answer the questions that Jake posed to me when we first met. So the blog post was basically me going full circle on that uh, and, and trying to present a view for the long term solution of having split tickets. Uh, in a second layer solution that is not going to suffer from the same problems as the current split ticket solution that is uh, entirely on chain. So that's just a, that's roughly a long term plan for uh, what we need to achieve in order to get uh, a second layer solution for split tickets. This is not necessarily the only one. Uh, I'm not even sure whether this is going to be the ultimate solution for split tickets, but that's a concrete solution for the problem of multi-owner tickets in, in Decred. Uh, main, uh, besides answering what, what I talked with Jake, uh, this is also mainly to, to be able to answer to stakeholders that complain that maybe the ticket price is too large and that uh, nobody is going to be able to participate in the network in the future because uh, as the the exchange or the price of the credit increases and the ticket price increases, then people are going to get priced out of the staking process of Decred. Uh, and so that's my concrete plan or that's my solution, uh, which I hope is one is a solution to this problem. So it, it's not, it, it, this is not going to become a Politeia, so, uh, a Politeia proposal immediately. This is mainly to be able to point at stuff that we can incrementally do to eventually reach the place where we can have a, a second layer solution for multi-owner tickets. Sure. And so something that's actually come up is, is, you know, we do episodically see people, it seems like one of the things people complain about the loudest, but use, you know, only in moderation is this split tickets. Uh, do you, do you know offhand how many split tickets, uh, you know, via the on-chain process there, that there are, that there are live currently? Last I recall, it was something like a hundred. 
Yeah, uh, it's been keeping steady at about 100 for for the past few months. Mm -hmm. So that's that's about the level we're at. So I feel like there's you know there's a certain amount of clamoring for this, like oh we need this and it should be one DCR one vote or, and I mean uh, something that, that you know that that uh, Mateus here it, it, Mateus is engineering around is is that if you have it, you know let's pretend tickets all cost one one DCR. What does that mean? Over time, you're going to have millions of tickets that you have to stuff into a database, and then if everybody's running a full node, they need to track all those tickets. So mm. the idea of ticket prices and there being a fixed number of tickets was to minimize the amount of shared state information everyone has to have on a full node. Mm -hmm. And you know what what Mateus's proposed solution here does is go is says listen instead of trying to fiddle with all these parameters on chain, we're just going to take each ticket and make it effectively infinitely divisible. Yeah. And then people can in theory get you know both staking returns and uh, some sovereignty out of that. That's kind of how I see right. it. It's a, a real long-term solution, you know, like a lot of things in Decred are. To you know, when years down the line, when things grow, valuation maybe increases. There's more people in the project. It it allows a low, lower barrier to entry. In fact, a very low barrier to entry, right? Uh, um, and and I think that's that's really important to the long-term infrastructure of the project. Uh, Mateus, when you put out that first ticket splitting idea, it was a bit contentious. Um, how has this new idea on layer two been received? Has it been similar or has it been positive? Uh, I think it's been about the same. Uh, the same. So, so one thing that uh, that I'd like to clarify maybe is that there's uh, on, on the original the original split on chain split ticket uh, had maybe uh, or has very very concrete criticism has very relevant criticism and very valid criticism for being for bloating the on-chain uh, process or the on-chain uh, data as Jake hints uh, it has so it has valid technical criticism that uh, I really uh, don't mind and it's true and uh, it's really what it is. The the lightning uh, split tickets has some other other kinds of criticism. So I think that the main one or the most prominent one uh, was about uh, the the work, the amount of work that is going to take to develop this, which is really uh, I think it's. Uh, I don't want to say it's a silly, because it's not a silly concern, but it's really not what the cred is about, because uh, the main point of the cred is that I can, for example, if I wanted to work full time on this, and if the and if I had a proposal on this, or if, even if I wanted to do this on my own time, then I could. It's not something that uh, that let's say anyone could stop me, <laughs> let's say. Uh, the whole point of Decred is that I could work on this uh, on my own. Uh, if, if, if there is demand for this, then people are going to start using it, irrespective of the criticism that other people might have. Uh, so I think that the, the LN work has been, I'm really only mainly paying attention at the technical criticism. I, I don't really care that much about the, the, the other types of criticism. So in that regard, uh, the LN work has been much better received than the on-chain work. Sure. That's, that's a perfect segue. It, you know, you're saying it's, it's a lot of work. Can you give us an overview of what that work is and, and kind of what new smart contracts you, you would be introducing to, to facilitate it? Right, so there are, are a bunch of new op codes, are a bunch of new uh, uh, smart contract constrictions that we'd need in order, in order to get the split ticket functionality off into LN in a safe and uh, in a reliable and in a usable stance, there are certain different levels of, of uh, support. 
So if we have the first opcode but not the other ones, uh, then we can we can do the split tickets over LN, but not great because you need a, a lot of uh, uh, coordination. And if, if we have the full thing, then we can do the better uh, the better solution that requires less coordination. Uh, there are about, I think, two new opcodes that we need to introduce, uh, two new signature hash types. So hopefully this on-chain, this consensus rule changes can be embedded in other rule changes. So for example, there is a, a proposal by Dave uh, to change how the signature hash for transactions is calculated to improve it, to make it faster uh, and, and require less memory. So we can, for example, embed my proposed changes in that proposal. Uh, the new opcodes that are required are, are really self-contained. So we can do them either one at a time or we can do them uh, once we do some other consensus change. So these things really are going to be uh, uh, an iterative uh, amount of changes that are going to hopefully be included. Uh, so, uh, and that's another point of the blog post is that we can try and, and, and do things as they happen. We don't really need to wait uh, a year or two to figure out, oh, now we could we need to introduce this new opcode. Let's do it now and go through the whole voting process to include and enable this. We can do it uh, when some other thing that we want is, is being voted on, and then we can include these new changes. But, it, but it's definitely going to be a, 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 a few months, a few, uh, a few years worth of, of work. Can you talk specifically about what the opcodes do? So one of the opcodes is to be able to, to convert or to check whether a given payment hash also corresponds to a given public key. So when you are doing a payment over Lightning, you use a payment a pre-image, a pre-image, which is that random 32-byte number, and to be able to create the the transaction structure that you need for the multi-owner ticket, which is basically a tree of of outputs, a tree of transactions that you need to be able to redeem, then you you need to be able to ascertain or you need to be able to figure out that each given payment hash for each given participant corresponds to a given public key so that you can do the swap between the on-chain funds and the off-chain invoice or the off-chain payment. In order to, to do this, this binding of a random number to a public key, so uh, I'm proposing a new opcode, which is going to pick up this random number, assume it, it is a... a uh, a private key, and then is going to ensure that the, this number is corresponds to a given private the private key to a given public key. So it's really binding the the two payment modes, binding the off-chain payment mode, which is based on payment hashes, and the on-chain payment mode, which is based on public and private keys. And then what? What about the second opcode? So that was one of them, right? This, so that's the the payment tree, right. and then the and then the the pub key from the you know from the uh, whatever it is the uh, the uh, pre image, uh, right? Pub from pre, yeah. And so the other the other the other opcode is mainly to be able to uh, bind the the return amount from the vote <laughs> or the revocation to a given percentage of the original funds. So one, one of the greatest difficulties in the, the multi-owner ticket is that the return amount is unknown at the time of, mm -hmm. at the time you're purchasing the ticket. So at the time you're purchasing the tickets, you don't know 
what is going to be your your reward amount or if the ticket is going to expire or if the ticket is going to be missed and you're going to re have to revoke and get back a different amount from your original amount. Mm -hmm. So currently in, in Bitcoin and in Decred, there's no way to, uh, you need to know how much the original input carried, how much it, it had, how much the original unspent transaction output had in order to be able to create a transaction that spends from this output. You really, you, you can do a, a random amount of spending from a given uh, previous input or previous output. Uh, the, the second upload, what it does is it binds the amount of a given output in your new transaction to a given percentage of the input amount of a corresponding uh, input on the transaction. So let's say that uh, a given participant is sending 1% of the ticket, which corresponds to X DCR, uh, and it's going to correspond in the vote or in the revocation transaction to a known, unknown, but 1% uh, uh, return amount, then you need to ensure that whatever the amount is for the vote or the revocation, that user gets 1% of the, of the return amount. So that's the, the thing that doesn't really exist today in the either in Bitcoin or in the cred. Some way to bind the returning amount of an output, not to an absolute amount of the original input, but to a, a percentage of the original input. So, so if, in terms of the big picture, if I had to describe what's going, what you're doing here is, is that there is, there's the inputs, and that's, uh, you know, there's a smart contract to sort of bind all those together, and then there's the outputs. So you're making sure that everything adds up. So you can basically take all of the lightning payments and wind them up into a single payment, and then when the ticket gets either voted, revoked, or expires, then the payments fan out on the other side, right? Yes, exactly. But you need to be able to that to do that without knowing how much you need to be able to do that uh, during the ticket constru construction time. At which point you don't know how much you're going to to get back, and that's the the that's the main challenge for doing this fan out. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't know how much you're going to each participant is going to get back, so you need to use percentages from the original amount instead of absolute amounts. Yeah. These, these opcodes seem to be very interesting and, and potentially have multiple applications. Uh, I, I certainly think there's a possibility for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there, there, uh, there are a couple of, I have a couple of ideas, but they are still very, very uh, <laughs> early stage. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I, that I should note is that this is only these opcodes only get uh, executed or only get uh, affected on the chain on the the non-cooperative cases of settlement. So if every right. single participant of the original ticket redeems their funds in over Lightning Network, then only a single output is created in on chain. And everyone redeems their funds off chain. Yeah. So you're only going to see these opcodes or these new smart contracts if, mm -hmm. for some reason, some of the participants don't cooperate. But what are the lawyers going to do? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a, a series of additional questions to, to kind of fire at you. Um, ENCLDI says, what other kinds of smart contracts use cases? can be integrated into layer two. We just talked about that. We don't need to talk about that further. Um, Oliver asks, could protocols that use LN be able to leverage each other's features? Like, and his, the example he used was could BTC maybe use DCR's governance, maybe like a polite implementation, or, um, or sort of tap into privacy features? Yeah, so once you have, once you have a, a, a multi-coin lightning network, uh, which I, I should note again, there's still a lot of uh, a lot of 
uh, research into how that's going to work and how we're going to actually make it work in practice. Uh, but once you have that, once you have an effective way of doing multi-coin payments instantly, you can come up with some interesting applications. For example, maybe you can use Bitcoin to purchase Decred and participate in staking via uh, a split ticket. And then that fund is going to, to be used in the same node that received the, the Bitcoin nodes are going to use on the DEX to perform a, a swap on the DEX. So, so really the ecosystem uh, can really be integrated by, by doing this sort of, sort of multi-coin uh, endpoint bindings. Very interesting. Did we miss anything? Do you have anything to add? Uh, I think that's that's pretty much it. Uh, hopefully, we can get more feedback now from users about uh, uh, how Lightning is behaving, uh, so we can iterate iterate faster our UI and UX. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Mateus. This is really enlightening. I think it's so interesting when you start to uh, really put together all these different pieces of, let's say, the roadmap puzzle. You know, and you add LN, and you add privacy, and you add the DEX, and you start to see, um, you know, kind of how complementary they are to, uh, you know, this sort of end goal of rebuilding a, a financial system in a fair way. So, thank you so much for joining us from thank Dustin Lathup, me. marketing lead. They, this was decred. No, this was a deep dive. Oh, we went deep. I mean, this is a this, this, is, a, this, is, a, this is a good long one. I mean, we almost got an hour and a half on here. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mateus. <laughs> you have a great day, and thank you for joining us. Cheers.